The date is April 1970. The Cold War between the United States and the USSR is in full swing, and tensions are still hot after the war in Korea as both sides watch the DMZ closely. An argument over a naval blockade almost turns nuclear. Yugoslavia under Tito looks at both power blocks and says, Nah. Turns out a lot of folks agreed with him. Algeria finally gains independence from France in 1962 after the Algerian War. The previous decade saw massive decolonization throughout Africa. Many of Britain's former colonies go on to join the Commonwealth nations. China and the USSR have a falling out. I wonder if America will take advantage of that. Meanwhile, in China, the Good Idea Fairy encourages Mao to increase his cult of personality and destabilize the country with a cultural revolution. A popular band breaks up. You may have heard of them. We got more of a problem. Okay, listen, listen, you guys. We've lost uh, fuel cell one. Don't worry, y'all. The crew survived. Richard Nixon, the 37th president of America, has been in office for over a year. Oh yeah, and depending on when you started counting, the Vietnam War has been going on for five to eight years. On April 30th, 1970, Nixon declares his plan to invade Cambodia. Now I know what you're thinking, but this will expand the war in Vietnam! This will bring the USSR and China into the war! I thought we were trying to leave Vietnam, not start another war in Cambodia! I know, I know, <laughs> but it's not as stupid as it sounds. Or, at least the ground invasion wasn't. I'm not really gonna defend the bombing campaign, just hear me out. Since the Cambodian incursion occurs because of the Vietnam War, first we need to take a step back and summarize Vietnam up to this point. Early in the Cold War, American policymakers had a talk. So you know those commies we hate. Yeah, what about them? Well, they have nukes now. We probably can't attack them directly. Oh, no worries fam, we'll just contain them. That policy turned out to be easier said than done. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu effectively ends the First Indochina War and French colonialism in Indochina. Negotiations in Geneva result in the separate states of South Vietnam under the French and their allies and North Vietnam under the communist Viet Minh. Vietnam's division is supposed to be a temporary arrangement, but, well, America's really sold on this containment stuff. So, Indochina War, Round 2, Fight! The first thing you need to know is that the international situation surrounding Vietnam is like Game of Thrones complex, so knowing all these acronyms will help you out. Some of these essentially mean the same thing, and some of them refer to the military or political wings of the same organization and are often used interchangeably. Got it? Good. Now a lot of complicated events occur between 1954 and 1970, but what you need to know for this video is that the communist government in Hanoi arms and finances the Viet Cong throughout the Vietnam War. Two of these three routes into Vietnam travel through Cambodia, the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the lesser known Sihanoukville port route. In order to defeat the Viet Cong, US policymakers begin to focus on ways to shut down these routes. Now imagine you're a neutral country with a minuscule military surrounded by powerful countries that want to kill each other. If you think this sounds like a terrible situation, you'd be right. By 1960, the neutral Cambodia finds itself in a hostile international climate. Prince Sihanouk, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, tries to maintain a policy of neutrality, but the Cold War blocs are closing in and convincing countries to pick a side. In 1962, China and Cambodia start getting a little too chummy. In August 1963, Cambodia breaks diplomatic relations with South Vietnam. On November 19, 1963, Cambodia renounces U.S. aid altogether. In March 1964, the prince authorizes a popular demonstration that seriously damages the U.S. and British embassies in Phnom Penh. In 1965, Sihanouk recognizes the Viet Cong as the country of South Vietnam. This is a defining moment where Cambodia's neutrality starts to clearly favor the communists. On May 3, 1965, after an air attack on a Cambodian village, Sihanouk breaks off diplomatic relations with the U.S. By 1966, Thailand, South Korea, South Vietnam, and the U.S. have no diplomatic relations with Cambodia. And some people believe Sihanouk is complicit in the Sihanoukville port route. In the late 60s, the Viet Cong create elaborate bases within the Cambodian border. Now it's one thing for a neutral country to turn a blind eye when insurgents retreat into their borders, but what's going on in Cambodia is exponentially worse. To be fair, Sihanouk is not okay with this, but he isn't really able to tell the Viet Cong no. By 1969, there are an estimated 50,000 Viet Cong within these sanctuaries. To put this in perspective, the entire country of Cambodia has less than 35,000 soldiers. On January 20th, 1969, Nixon is elected president on the platform of leaving Vietnam on good terms. 
Unfortunately, at this point in the war, the enemy know they have the upper hand, and they don't have any intention of negotiating. On February 23rd, 1969, communist forces conduct a countrywide attack against South Vietnam, killing more than 400 American soldiers. Nixon believes he'll need to fight dirty to get the Viet Cong to negotiate an armistice. So in response to the attacks in February, on March 17th, 1969, Nixon authorizes a secret bombing campaign to target communist sanctuaries within Cambodia. Unfortunately, this bombardment occurs within populated areas. Several years before the massive implementation of smart bombs. So not only do the bombs struggle to hit their targets, but they also cause an incredible amount of collateral damage. According to historian Kenton Clymer, this indiscriminate destruction destabilizes Cambodia, creates a migrant crisis, and drives a lot of Cambodians to join the radical communist group the Khmer Rouge. In April 1969, Nixon reopens negotiations with Cambodia. On January 6, 1970, Sihanouk departs Cambodia to receive medication in France and to consult China and the USSR. In early March 1970, skirmishes between the Cambodians and the Viet Cong in Sve Ring culminate in riots outside the North Vietnam and Viet Cong embassies. On March 16th, the Cambodians ask the communists to leave. Not only do the communists refuse, they demand payments for the damages to their embassies. According to a source in the Cambodian military, on March 18th, 1970, while Sihanouk is outside the country, the two legislative bodies of Cambodia vote to remove him from office. The Cambodian government is tired of Sihanouk's double dealings and the Viet Cong violating Cambodia neutrality. Lan Nol, the chief of government and prime minister, effectively becomes the new head of Cambodia. Critics of the Cambodian incursion claim that we staged this coup, and while we've certainly dabbled in coup staging in the past, it's hard to say how involved America was this time, certainly less than normal. That being said, we certainly benefited from the coup. On March 27th, violent demonstrations erupt in Kampong Cham and Prey Vinh against Lan Nol's government. NVA and Viet Cong cadres detained during these demonstrations point to outside influences creating the riots. The communists likely started these riots to make the conflict in Cambodia look more like a civil war to divide international opinion against the new regime. On the same day, North Vietnam and the Viet Cong abandoned their embassies in Phnom Penh. On March 29th, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong break diplomatic relations with Cambodia and refuse to even discuss withdrawing their forces. On the same day, their forces attack several Cambodian provinces. The Cambodian forces are understaffed, undertrained, and they're currently under-equipped with an unholy assortment of three very different technologies from four world powers. Lan Nol knows that they aren't qualified to fight the communists, so on April 14th he appeals to the countries of all world blocs to aid him in the fight against Vietnamese communism. This roughly translates to, America, hurry up and get over here! On the same day, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam's Third Corps launches a three-day operation into the Angels Wing area of Sve Ring Province. On April 20th, the Arvin's 9th Division attacks west of the Crow's Nest, about 6 kilometers inside Cambodia, capturing some supplies before returning on the 23rd. On April 26th, the National Security Council meet with President Nixon to discuss what to do with Cambodia. Nixon decides to have his forces penetrate up to 30 kilometers into Cambodia and return into Vietnam no later than June 30th. On April 30th, President Nixon addresses the American people about his decision. His 20-minute speech boils down to, We need to win the war in Vietnam. And to do this, we need to destroy the Viet Cong sanctuaries within Cambodia. On April 30th, U.S. and Arvin forces begin the Cambodian incursion. After the first couple days, the U.S. and Arvin forces lose the element of surprise. Most of the communist forces wisely decide to avoid confrontation with the U.S. forces by retreating past the 30-kilometer mark while waiting for the June 30th deadline. The Americans consequently spend most of their time searching for concealed storage facilities, mostly underground, as opposed to fighting decisive battles. On May 5th, 1970, the U.S. incursion is validated when GIs discover a series of enemy shelters so big the GIs call it the city. I knew they had extensive bases in here. Man, wouldn't it be awful to invade a country and not find what we're looking for? For the Arvin forces, the Cambodian incursion marks their largest combined operation, and the first time any of their units operate without American advisors. Since the U.S. forces are not allowed to travel beyond the 30-kilometer zone, the Arvin forces conduct all operations beyond that point. Despite the high desertion rates among the Arvin forces, U.S. advisors see improvements in the Arvin's kill ratio, use of artillery, and coordination with intelligence. Despite operating far from their supply bases, Arvin logistics also perform admirably. By May 18th, Arvin forces have successfully repatriated over 17,000 Vietnamese. Finally, on May 27th, Cambodia restores diplomatic relations with the Republic of South Vietnam. This is a little awkward, since Arvin forces have been fighting inside Cambodia for almost a month. But 
But whatever. American forces begin returning on June 20th, and by June 29th, the last U.S. units are back in Vietnam. During the incursion, U.S. and Arvin forces destroy all Viet Cong infrastructure along the border. After the incursion, Vietnamese sources report the capture of 22,892 individual weapons, 2,509 crew served weapons, 2,500 tons of ammunition, over 14 million pounds of rice, a large surplus of various medical supplies, and 435 vehicles. U.S. and Arvin forces also kill 11,349 enemy forces and captured another 2,328 prisoners. Unfortunately, the communist forces in Cambodia were estimated at 50,000, and some estimates put them at 60,000. So even by modest standards, the communist forces in Cambodia are still numerically greater than the Cambodian forces. Intelligence estimates claim the Cambodian incursion paralyzed Viet Cong operations for at least six to nine months. Unfortunately, the US, Saigon, and Cambodia failed to achieve long-term benefits from the incursion. At the political level, this failure is largely because of successful communist propaganda General Sutsukin writes about this phenomenon afterwards. All of this deception was but common communist fare to those who were familiar with the communist strategy in Asia. However, to those ill-informed of this communist practice, as was the case with several foreign observers, the enemy bait was palatable, and for a certain time, questions arose as to whether or not the Cambodian protests against the armed and overt aggression of the NVA VC forces were in fact justified. How perfect the communist screenplay was. In his book, The United States and Cambodia, A Troubled Relationship, Kitten Clymer describes this exact phenomenon. The non-communist countries closest to Vietnam actually approve of the incursion, whereas the countries removed from the situation are absolutely horrified and refuse to establish relations with Cambodia. The US domestic response mirrors the international scene. Congress is not okay with the incursion. That tends to happen when they're not consulted. The public is largely against the incursion as well. On May 4th, 1970, less than a week after Nixon's address, 28 National Guardsmen fire shots into a crowd, killing four students at Kent State. And on May 15th, city police kill two more students at Jackson State University. The South Vietnamese arguably benefit the most from the incursion. Following the incursion, U.S. forces remove multiple U.S. advisors from Arvin units. Arvin commanders see this as a sign of improvement and legitimacy. The confidence and the experience the Arvin forces gained from the Cambodian incursion prove invaluable for Vietnamization. This operation also significantly reduces Viet Cong activity within Vietnam and allows U.S. forces to withdraw on schedule. The U.S. ground forces never enter Cambodia again. By June 1970, the struggling Cambodian forces create the La Nol Line with the idea of surviving south of it, consolidating all of their territory south of the line, and regaining lost territory north of the line. After a string of crushing defeats, by November 1972, the government creates another line farther south. During this demoralizing period, the most prominent political political figures in Cambodia form violent political parties vying for control. Meanwhile, the Cambodian military is suffering from inconsistent pay, insufficient food, and shady promotions. From 1972 to 1974, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese convert the war in Cambodia into a civil war by passing off the war to the ever-growing Khmer Rouge. By making the war a civil war, there is less justification for the international community to intervene. Finally, on the 17th of April, 1975, the Khmer Rouge are victorious. Schools are closed, currency is abolished, religions are banned, and the people go into forced labor camps with constant surveillance, prevalent famine, terror, and executions. An estimated 2 million people are killed in the Cambodian genocide. Nowadays, there seems to be a popular trend to just bash America for every foreign policy decision we've made. But I think a lot of this criticism tries to divorce what happened from the context surrounding these decisions. That's why most of this video was dedicated to the context surrounding the Cambodian incursion. But I'm obviously biased, and you guys know where I'm coming from, so feel free to take what I say with a grain of salt and disagree in the comments. Y'all have probably picked up on the fact that my upload schedule is kinda yeah. whack. So if you like this content and you've already subscribed, make sure you smash that liberty bell so you get a notification for your next healthy dose of patriotism. When I get around to it. As always, God bless you, and God bless America.